Well, our readings, brothers and sisters, are currently taking us through Isaiah. Now, I know that as an ecclesia, you're going through Isaiah in your Bible classes. So I did look to see what other readings there are for today. But then I thought, but it's Isaiah. How could I possibly turn down doing an exhort on Isaiah? Especially when it's in this second half. And I I just really love this section of Isaiah. So I hope I don't tread on anyone's toes, those who might be coming up to speak in your Bible classes soon. But rather, I hope that what we say this morning just complements what you're doing in your Bible classes. Because this morning, what I would really like to do is, is take a step back and try and take in the bigger picture of what Isaiah is doing, especially in this second half that goes from chapter 40 through to chapter 66. And in our daily readings, today is chapter 42. So we've just started in this second half. Because you'll have noticed that there is a dramatic change in tone, in language, in thought, in this second half. Just the the, the very way it begins is eye-catching. Come back to chapter 40 for a brief moment. It's noticeably different from the first half. In the very opening statement that's made in verse 1 of Isaiah 40, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Now this is a very new idea. Three times in that opening few sentences there of this section, you get the expression of comfort. Some even see that that's the title for this second half. They call it the book of comfort. In contrast, in stark contrast to the first half, which might be called the book of judgment. Because what do you think of when you hear the word comfort? What images are conjured up in your minds, brothers and sisters? What feelings, emotions or words do you think of? When you're listening to this opening statement here of comfort, comfort ye my people. Well, I dare say that you associate it with warmth, with encouragement, with Gentleness, support, sympathy, kindness. And you you get emotions and feelings of calmness, relief. Anxiety levels have completely dropped. There's no more tension, no more stress. Comfort. So I wonder how you've come here this morning, brothers and sisters, and, and whether or not... Life is stressing you out a little bit through personal problems or family issues or ecclesial matters that may be causing you sleepless nights, creating strain in some of your relationships, mental anguish. You see, that's quite a different feeling to having comfort, isn't it? And and we come here this morning maybe carrying some of that weight looking for comfort in what we're doing as we remember the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is the section of Isaiah that provides the the answers to all of those burdens that we might be carrying. It demonstrates that there is relief from all of these strains. God has it all in hand. You just have to believe him. You have to trust him. You have to serve him. In the first half, which is chapter 1 to chapter 39, you have to go all the way back to chapter 12 to get any reference to the word comfort, to find this word comfort. And and it's only used that one time in the whole of the first half. Just come back to chapter 12. It's like a little taste given to us way back in chapter 12 of what the second half is going to be all about. So we come back to chapter 12 and we read this in verse 1. 
And in that day thou shalt say, O Yahweh, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. It's a vision of the future, isn't it? In that day. Something still to come. It's way down the track. It seems so distant. It seems so unreal. Like untouchable. You're trying to reach it and, and it's out of reach. It's in that day. Well, the second half of Isaiah zones in on comfort, brothers and sisters. That it's not as distant and, and, and out of touch as it might have felt this morning when you were coming here feeling all of that anxiety and stress. It's not out of touch. It's available to any who wish to accept it. On God's terms, yes, but still available nonetheless. So what we find is in the second half, comfort is mentioned 12 times. It really is a theme of the second half. But then in chapter 12, verse 2, we read, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yahweh, Yahweh is my strength and my song. My song. He has also become my salvation. So you get the word salvation twice in verse 2. God is my salvation. And that's interesting because salvation is another theme taken up in the second half, quite extensively. You only get it seven times mentioned in the first half, but you get it mentioned 19 times in the second half. But then in verse 3, we read in chapter 12, Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And joy is a theme that comes up in the second half, extensively, all the way through. So chapter 12 is just giving us a little bit of a taste of what to expect when we get to the second half. It's not written by a different Isaiah, as some claim. It's not a different section altogether and really shouldn't be part of Isaiah. It's the same author. He's giving you a taste of what he's going to expand upon later on in the book. But at first glance, it almost sounds like a different God is in the first half to the God of the second half. But, but that's not the case, brothers and sisters. I'm sure as you've been going through the readings, you'll have come across this phrase, which is in chapter 12, verse 6, at the end of verse 6. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel. And he's called that all the way through Isaiah. 13 times in the first half, 11 times in the second half. Almost the same. All the way through. It's the same God throughout. He is holy. He is righteous. There's no doubting that. But what is different is the way he demonstrates his holiness, the way he demonstrates or manifests his righteousness. Because in the first half of Isaiah, God's righteousness is always linked with judgment. That's why we said that some title, the first half of Isaiah, the book of judgment. Every time you come across, well not every time, but very often you come across the word righteousness it's associated, it's joined, it's linked with judgment. Just let me give you an illustration of this, something worth going home and colouring in as you're going through the readings, is this connection between righteousness and judgment. Way back in chapter 1, just come back to chapter 1. You get it twice here in the very opening chapter. We read in verse 21, How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. So judgment and righteousness were seen in the city. But that's all gone now. You don't see either of those things. Righteousness and judgment. Down in verse 27 though, in the future it's going to be a different story. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment 
and her converts with righteousness. Chapter 5. Come over to chapter 5. Same idea. These two words linked together. Verse 7. For the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. So you get these two words linked together. And that, of course, is in contrast to God, who in verse 16 of chapter 5, but Yahweh of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Can you see how he's bringing these two ideas together? Righteousness that is manifested in God's judgments. And that happens all the way through the first half. I'm not going to go through all of them this morning. Maybe we can just skip over to chapter 32 and 33, which is the last references. But there's many more in between. Come over to chapter 32 and you'll just see how even at the end of this first half, these ideas are still linked together. And the opening words of chapter 32, striking, aren't they? Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. There they are, brought together. The king of righteousness and the princes who rule in judgment. In that day, in verse 16, judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And 33 verse 5, Yahweh is exalted for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. I don't think you can miss the point, brothers and sisters, that righteousness in the first half is manifested through judgment. That's how you see God's righteousness, in his judgments. That could be a bit scary, just thinking about that. Put people off. The judgments of God are severe. The first half is very harsh, very severe. And we say, well, where's comfort in that? I don't read or feel comfort when I read about God's judgments as the only way to understand his righteousness. How can I ever be saved if I have to measure up to God's judgments? I can't do it. It's hopeless. I give up. You see, God says, don't give up. I can save you. You see, because my righteousness is not only associated with judgment, my righteousness is also linked with salvation. And he says, let me show you how. And so, ten times righteousness and judgment are found in the first half. Well, in the second half, you don't find that. You find righteousness linked with salvation. Eleven times. Let me just show you some of them. Come to chapter 45. God's righteousness is associated as being synonymous with his salvation. Oh, that's a, a very different story to being associated with his judgments. So chapter 45, verse 8 Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. So coming down from heaven is righteousness. And then let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation. So coming down is righteousness, and coming up is salvation. Let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. Chapter 46, verse 13. We're going to go through these in the next week or so. So something to look out for. 46 verse 13. I bring near my righteousness, which is the same as saying, my salvation shall not tarry. Sorry, I missed a little bit out there. I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, which is the same as saying, my salvation shall not tarry. God's righteousness and his salvation are seen synonymous here. They're interchangeable. Chapter 51. Now, you can't miss the point in chapter 51, brothers and sisters, because in very quick succession, we have three verses, almost consecutive, verse 5, 6, and 8, where he says repeatedly, verse 5, chapter 51, 
My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth. At the end of verse 6, my salvation shall be forever, my righteousness shall not be abolished. At the end of verse 8, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. You can't miss the point, can you? It's staring you in the face. It goes all the way through. But the one I want to just maybe zone in on a little bit more is come back to chapter 45 and verse 21. Because this is what God's saying to his people here. Chapter 45, verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh, and beside me, now note this, brothers and sisters, no God, a just God, a righteous God, and a saviour, righteousness and salvation, both belong to this one true God. You won't find righteousness or salvation in any other So don't despair, brothers and sisters. Don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. There is reason to rejoice. There is reason to be glad. There is reason to be full of joy. And so as we said, joy is a major theme. Three times it's found in the first half, 14 times in the second half, and so on and so forth. All throughout the second half, there is a completely different focus You get the redeemer or being redeemed mentioned 24 times. You get light as opposed to darkness mentioned 12 times. You get the Gentiles only mentioned once in all the first half in chapter 11, 14 times. You see, Gentiles can participate in this salvation too. Gentiles can experience this comfort too. Gentiles can share in this joy as well. That's you and me, brothers and sisters. That's us. We find our place in this second half. We're mentioned. And there's many other themes, you may like to look out for them, where there's stark contrasts in this second half from the first half. But I think that's enough to show the focus and emphasis that God is placing in this second half. Now, I keep mentioning two halves, all right? And that's because... There are four chapters sort of in the middle of Isaiah which are very different from the rest of the book. They stand apart. They're not written by Isaiah. Although Isaiah is mentioned in those chapters, they go from chapter 36 to 39. Although Isaiah is a character mentioned in these chapters, they're not written by him. They're written in prose. They're described as the historical chapters because they're telling a story. And what they do is they act a little bit like a hinge that holds the two halves together. And just like a hinge, I'm a carpenter, so I know this. Maybe some of you don't quite understand how a hinge works. Well, there's two parts to a hinge, and one part of the hinge fixes to the door, and the other part of the hinge fixes to the frame. But the hinge has two parts, and then they're holding up two parts, a door and a frame. Well... Isaiah has two halves, and they're linked together by this hinge, these chapters, chapter 36 to 39. But chapter 36, although it's four chapters, it's really two stories. And the first story links to the first half of Isaiah, and the second story links to the second half of Isaiah. And I I love just... Just seeing how Isaiah puts this all together. To me, 66 chapters, it seems so daunting. It seems so big. It's one of the longest books in the Bible. It takes weeks to do the readings in Isaiah. You almost have forgotten what you read in chapter 1 and 2 by the time you get to this section of Isaiah. And you think, what is it all about? How do you piece this together? What's the structure? What's Isaiah doing? Well, I actually think he's a very neat writer. He's very poetic 
and grand as well and uses expressions like no other prophet does. But at the same time, he's got order and structure. And just the way he pieces this all together, I think, is marvellous. So what we have in the first story, chapter 36 and 37, is all about Assyria. And remember, Assyria, the dominant power of the time, came right up knocking on the door of Hezekiah and the city of Jerusalem, besieging the city. But in chapter 37 and verse 30, God gives them a sign. All right, see the sign in verse 30? And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year you will sow. So for two years there'll be no sowing, no harvest, but there'll be plenty to eat. That's the sign. There'll be more than enough for everybody. And then what God does at the end of chapter 37 he wrought a miraculous victory. Oh, what a victory this was. 185,000 Assyrians perish in one night. Gone, just like that. Puff of wind, gone. And Sennacherib and his henchman, Rabshaker, have to go home with their tail between their legs. But the second story, brothers and sisters... While it happens at the very same time, you don't really get much of a hint of that. It's a completely different story. This story has Hezekiah sick unto death, and he prays to God, and God gives another sign. We know the sign. The sundial goes back 10 degrees. God gives a sign, and he wrought another miraculous, not victory, but recovery. Hezekiah is given 15 years extension of life. We don't really read about Assyria in this chapter. In the other story, Assyria all over it. In this story, it's about Babylon. It's about Merodach Baladan coming down and wanting to share his joy with Hezekiah at Hezekiah's recovery and saying, look, we could be allies. Oh, what a good idea, says Hezekiah. Come and have a look. Here's my whole house. So rather than being about Assyrian domination, which is what the first story was about, this is all about the future Babylonian domination that will come because of Hezekiah's foolishness. And what you find, brothers and sisters, is that the two halves of Isaiah really bear that out. So the first half of Isaiah is all about Assyrian domination, predominantly, and God helping them to be delivered from the Assyrian domination. But the second half is predominantly about the coming Babylonian domination, and God helping them to be delivered from that. And so I think it's fair to say that these two stories provide the backdrop to all of Isaiah and becomes the hinge by which the two halves of Isaiah are held together. I think it's really quite remarkable how Isaiah has done that. Now, in addition to that, this, this I think, is, is proof that there's these two halves because in the first story, in the historical section, at the very nub of that story, the question was, who is the greater king? Is it King Sennacherib, backed by his gods? Or is it King Hezekiah, backed by his god? Who's the greater king? Who really is the dominant king? Which enemy will be successful? Now, we know the outcome of that. We know Hezekiah was the, the, the greater king. His God proved to be the greater God. But what you find is in the first half of Isaiah, kingship is the focus. The word king occurs 23 times, only occurs four times in the second half. And that's why you get four prophecies of the coming faithful king. One's in chapter 9, one's in chapter 11, one's in chapter 32, one's in chapter 33. All the way through you get these, these prophecies of the coming faithful 
king. But the second story is very different. It's not about kingship in this story, brothers and sisters. This is about who do you choose as your friends? As you mix in the world through school or work, who do you choose as your friends, brothers and sisters? Who do you reach out to in times of need? Who do you respond to who comes to you with accolades and praise? Who do you willingly choose to be of service to? Who do you trust? Well, in the second story, Hezekiah threw his lot in with Merodach Baladan. He seems a friendly chap. He's brought his ambassadors down. He's giving me uh, warm accolades about my recovery. Why not choose to ally with, with him? So, although the focus in the first half is on kingship, the focus in the second half is on service. What type of servant are you, brother, sister? And so we find the word servant, which only occurs three times in the first half, occurs 20 times in the second half. And the word servants, the plural, only once in the first half and 11 times in the second half. Now I know this is a lot of numbers, brothers and sisters, and demonstrating to you just the theme and the tone of the two halves. But I think you'll appreciate when we, when we get to, to the nub of some of this as to, as to why it's necessary that God had to put it like this. And so the second half is about service. So guess what? I think you're going through this at the moment or have started going through. You get four prophecies of the coming faithful servant in the second half. We sometimes call them the suffering servant songs. We call them the servant songs. And there's four, just like the first half had four prophecies of the coming king, the second half has four prophecies of the coming servant. And our daily readings today in chapter 42 introduces us to the first song. So we're not going to uh, have a look at uh, any of that this morning, we, we don't have time. But just summarising briefly, brothers and sisters, in case you got lost, because I know it's uh, a bit of analysing of, of facts. While the whole work of Isaiah is about salvation, and Isaiah's name means the salvation of God, so clearly he's going to write about salvation, it's the second half of Isaiah where this theme is focused on along with themes of comfort, joy, redemption, light springing up, which is extended to the Gentiles as well. That's, that's you and me, as we said, brothers and sisters. And, and this is all found in chapter 40 to 66 in exquisite detail. Barely mentioned in the first half, but opened up beautifully in the second half. But here's the question. If it be asked... Well, who are the recipients of this salvation? Who are those who receive comfort? Who are those who experience joy? Who are those who can bask in the light, be given redemption? Well, that's a very valid question. And, and God's going to answer that in this section. Because clearly, this is not something that God would just dish out slapdash. Oh, I like them, I like the colour of their hair, I like the way they're, they're clothed. Yeah, I'll give them salvation. I'll provide them comfort. We know God's not like that. Not at all. He's holy, remember. The Holy One of Israel, that, that phrase, that title of God that goes all the way through Isaiah. He will never compromise his holiness. So he won't just dish it out, slapdash. He's righteous, remember. Isaiah 45, verse 21, we looked at earlier. I may be a saviour, but I'm still righteous. I'm a righteous God and a saviour. I will not compromise my righteousness either. And although righteousness was associated with judgment in the first half, and here it's associated with salvation, there's still righteousness there. Righteousness hasn't disappeared Righteousness is still the character of God. So the question is, who will be saved? Well, I think this is where it gets quite exciting because 
Isaiah, he's not just a broad brush writer. He, he also has structure when you narrow things down. And as I said before, you may think, well, Isaiah, 66 chapters, there's so many. I can't follow what's going on. He seems all over the place. It just seems chaotic. Well, it's not. Isaiah really is one of the most structured books in the Bible. And what we find is that the second half of Isaiah is itself split into two halves. We have chapter 40 to 55, which is what we're going through in our daily readings at the moment. I think you're started or just about to start going through that section in your Bible classes. And what chapter 40 to 55 concentrates on is about them being in Babylon in chapter 40 to 48. But then Cyrus comes and he delivers them and he opens the two-lead gate that goes into the, to the city and he, he rescues them and he makes a decree to be able to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. And so in chapter 49 to 55, you get that language of them coming back and the waste places of Jerusalem being rebuilt and the gates being put up again and the walls being uh, bre- uh, being, uh, which were breached being joined together again and the temple being rebuilt and worship starting again in Jerusalem. Whereas in chapter 56 to 66, it's very different because Babylon's not mentioned. They've left Babylon. They've come back. This is now about life back in Jerusalem after the return. There's language in this half about the city being completely rebuilt. The walls are there. The gates are there. The temple's now being used. Worship has been reinstituted. There's offerings. There's sacrifices. There's Sabbath keeping. There's mentions of priests and ministers of God. And so that's the time... After they came back, in fact, I would suggest it's the time all the way up to the days of Christ. So that's what this second half of Isaiah splits into, two more halves. And you say, well, why? How does that help us? Well, a question regarding service comes up in both sections. But they're two very different questions. You see, in chapter 40 to 55, brothers and sisters, they've been in Babylon for 70 years. But God says, I'm promising you deliverance. Isaiah's writing this 100 years before. God will come and deliver you. You might be captives in Babylon, but he's going to come and save you. Comfort is coming. Salvation is near. God will save. But the big question out of that, brothers and sisters, is, well, Who is this God? You just put yourselves in their shoes. I don't know if you've done any research on Babylon or been to the Berlin Museum or the British Museum or the Louvre and seen some of the relics that they've discovered from Babylon. Babylon was an impressive city. It wasn't a place you didn't want to leave. You'd be quite comfortable staying in Babylon. They had comforts galore. In Babylon, brothers and sisters. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Come out of Babylon. Why? I'm pretty comfortable right here, thank you very much. They say that they had three-story houses in Babylon. They had running water in the kitchens. All the creature comforts you could wish for. They were educated. They were appreciated. They were accepted. They already had enough comforts. And then there was the gods, Bel and Nebo. And clearly, you know, you got to attribute something to them because they've got it so good here. Their gods must be just as powerful, just as good to give us this this really nice existence. Babylon was great. Why would you leave Babylon? Who is this God that says he's going to deliver us from Babylon? We don't need him. Do we really need saving from Babylon? Who are you calling yourself the true God when you say, I am God and there is none else? A little phrase to colour in chapter 40 to 48. I am God and there is none else. You see, what God does in chapter 40 to 48, brothers and sisters, is that he lists all his credentials. Here's my credentials. This is why I'm the true God. I called Cyrus, he says. And lo and behold, 100 years later, he's mentioned by name, 100 years later, outside the city wall, a man called Cyrus was actually there. It's like, wow. God mentioned that to Isaiah 100 years ago. That's amazing. See, I know the end from the beginning. These are my credentials. I called you too, Israel. 
You're my witnesses. I know the end from the beginning. I'm the true God. So come to chapter 48 and verse 20, brothers and sisters, because here's God's plea. He says in chapter 48, verse 20, Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans. That would have been quite a hard thing to do, brothers and sisters, living in the comforts of Babylon. Why would you want to leave? Well, because I'm the true God. And I want you to serve me. I don't want you to serve Babylon. Oh, but we like it here. This is too nice. No, no, no. You need to get out. You need to flee. Come to chapter 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Don't touch the unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Get out of Babylon. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of Yahweh. Ooh, Babylon's unclean? I don't see it quite like that. I'm liking it here. They're very nice. They're very affable. They're friendly. We don't have any worries here in Babylon. But here God's saying they're unclean. Babylon can't save you. Only the God of Israel can. That was the urgent plea. Babylon is not your friend. Hezekiah made a major, massive mistake thinking that Babylon was his friends. Don't serve him. He's your deadly enemy. You see, what happened, brothers and sisters, is that many Israelites rebelled. They had it too good in Babylon, so they chose to stay. They served Babylon's gods instead. They didn't want to serve the true God. So what you find, it's in this section that God gives four prophecies of a coming faithful servant, one who would really serve God, one who would be obedient to God, not rebellious. Even under suffering, this servant would be obedient. And because of that, God's going to save him. So if you want to know who God's going to save, in the very first instance, it's the faithful servant of God, singular. That's who he will save. That's what that section is highlighting. So, although I said to you the word servant and the word servants, plural, occur extensively throughout the second half of Isaiah... It's the word servant singular that occurs in this section in 40 to 55. You don't find the word servants. It's always the singular servant, the faithful servant. Well, you're not always sure who it is. Sometimes you say, well, is this servant Israel? Is it Cyrus? Is it Hezekiah? Who is this true servant? Which servant is it that God's going to save? Well, it's the one mentioned in those four songs, the specially anointed one. In our readings for today, in chapter 42, verse 1, he's anointed as a faithful servant who serves only God. He's the servant that God will save, not the rebellious Israel servant. He won't be saved. They're too rebellious. They're disobedient. And, of course, we've come here to remember that faithful servant, brothers and sisters. Obedient to his God in every way, even unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, that was one of the most horrendous sufferings possible, wasn't it? But even through all of that, he stayed faithful and obedient. And of course, you'll eventually get to Isaiah 53, which describes all of that, the faithful servant, obedient even during the most horrendous suffering. And so, of course, most of them stayed in Babylon, brothers and sisters. But there were a few. I think 42,000 or thereabouts, we're told in Ezra and Nehemiah, who came back to Jerusalem in that first call to return, the first wave. Not many out of how many actually went into captivity. Not many, but some. They left Babylon. They left Babylon's gods. They left all the creature comforts there, the three-story homes and the running water in the kitchen, to come back to a ruinous heap, believing in the true God, fully understanding who the true God is. It's the God of Israel, no question about that. He's the one to serve. 
And I guess in that sense, that's similar to us, brothers and sisters. We've come out of Babylon, we've come out of the world, haven't we? Because we know, we understand that there is only one true God. You, you've come to understand that. You know that. That's why you're meeting here this morning. Because you've come out of Babylon, the world, understanding that their gods are not true. There's only one true God. We've answered that question, haven't we, for ourselves? None of us here have any doubt about that. I know that. You know that. One true God. But in chapter 56, to the end of Isaiah... There's a change of direction, brothers, brothers and sisters. The question isn't now, who is the true God? This section is not about discovering who the true God is. This section is about discovering what the true way to worship him is. Oh, that's different. This is not about coming out of Babylon, coming out of the world. This is about living in Jerusalem with temple service. This is living in the ecclesia, brothers and sisters. And while we all know who the true God is, the question for us, brothers and sisters, is are we worshipping him the right way? Are we worshipping the true God in the true way? Are we worshipping him in a way that is acceptable to him? Oh, so very different, isn't it? Two very different questions. And while we may all know the answer to the first one, I think we're all still learning what the answer to the second one is. It's a journey, isn't it, of discovering how does God want us to worship him? In fact, what we have here in these two parts of the second half, brothers and sisters, is the two extremes being displayed by Israel of what salvation to them looks like. Remember, this second half is about salvation. Well, what does salvation look like to you, brothers and sisters? What's your understanding of the atonement, salvation? Well, their understanding of the atonement had two extremes. The ones that stayed in Babylon, they were clearly substituting the true God for the gods of Babylon. And it was all right to just have open fellowship with the gods of Babylon and the world. It didn't matter. They said, as long as you worship some god, you'll be okay. And that's what you hear many churches out there saying. It's okay. We can get together. We can join up. That's worldly thinking. That's Babylon thinking. That's substitution. Substitution is not okay. It will not bring salvation, brothers and sisters. But what about those who returned, knowing who the true God is? Well, you see, they were still discovering his character. And for many of them, salvation was all about what you did. Your works. And so in chapter 56, you get introduced to Sabbath keeping. The first time in Isaiah, you get introduced to Sabbath keeping. Oh, we keep the Sabbath meticulously. Sabbath keeping, that's what we're all about. I fast, chapter 58 and 59. I fast, I do it regularly, I do it religiously. Oh, I must be okay. Surely God must accept me. He must save me. I deserve to be saved. Just have a look at chapter 58. Chapter 58. Verse 2. They seek me daily. You know, they come to the meetings all the time. They go every Sunday, every Bible class. They even attend the youth group, even if they're not the right age. They still go. If they're too old, they still see themselves as young. They're always involved in religious activity. They seek me daily and delight to know my ways. He's the true God. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. You'd think they're marvellous, wouldn't you? Just reading those verses. You'd think, what a fine ecclesia that they've come back and become. They've left the gods of Babylon. They haven't substituted God For any of them, he's the true God. Let's show our delight in approaching unto him. 
Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and you're not looking? You're not watching us. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? We've fasted, punished ourselves by not taking food in your name. But you're not taking any knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast, you find your pleasure and exact, meticulously, legalistically, you exact all your labours. It's all about you and your works. Down at the end of verse 5. Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to Yahweh? You see, just by coming here every Sunday, brothers and sisters, and attending Bible classes and doing your daily readings does not necessarily mean that what you're doing is acceptable to Yahweh. That's what this is saying. You might have come out of the world. You might have said, I know there's only one true God, but are you worshipping him the true way? You see... They thought that salvation came through law-keeping, through what we call today legalism. And legalism is the complete opposite to substitution. The two extremes on the atonement are being uh, corrected here in Isaiah. God's saying, let me demonstrate you to you all about salvation. This method's wrong, you need to come out of Babylon, but this method is also wrong. You need to see the difference between the two. Oh, Isaiah really is getting down into the nub, isn't he? He's really grinding this home. And 56 to 66 starts to really make us uncomfortable sometimes. This is the section, brothers and sisters, when you come to it, to really focus on and see what is Isaiah talking about. Legalism is a cursed doctrine, brothers and sisters, but unfortunately it's everywhere in the brotherhood. Not necessarily spoken off the platform, but lived in our lives. Because keeping law is easier than doing what God's asking. Come back to chapter 53 for a moment. I told you that the word servant, singular, occurs in this first half, 40 to 55. But this servant, it comes to a climax in chapter 53, and this faithful servant in chapter 53 is going to go through some horrendous suffering, and you say, why? What would be the benefit of that? What would be the outcome? What would be the result of him being like this? Well, the result, brothers and sisters is that there would come from his work other servants. Verse 10. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. You see, he would be the first of many. This servant would be the first of many servants. There were more coming. Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. There's more coming, you see. And so in chapter 56, right through to chapter 66, you don't see the word servant anymore. It's always servants. How do the servants of God live their lives? More were coming. How do the servants, what's a true servant, brothers and sisters? What constitutes true service? The Jew thought law keeping, legalism, external works. But God is going to show, brothers and sisters, they are not the true servants. Time's really gone. I thought we might get a little bit further than this. But let me just show you two references about servants at the beginning and end of this section in chapter 56 and then chapter 65. You see, in chapter 56, brothers and sisters, in verse 6, talking about keeping the Sabbath, he says, Also the sons of strangers that join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his 
servants. Okay, and there's a list there given of what they should be doing. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Well, of course, they weren't doing that. And in chapter 58 and 59, it's clear they were polluting the Sabbath. And they were doing everything opposite to what the Sabbath was all about. So come over to chapter 65. So he meanders through all of those arguments, brothers and sisters. He demonstrates what true service really is, what a true fast is, what true Sabbath keeping is, what true offerings are all about. And even though they were crying unto God, it, it wasn't true service. So in verse 11 of chapter 65, he brings this, this section to a conclusion when he says this, But ye are they that forsake Yahweh, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink unto that offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you didn't answer. And they say, well, we did. Have a look at chapter 58, verse 1. We did. And God says, no, no, read the rest of chapter 58. Read the rest of chapter 59. You didn't. When I spake, you didn't hear. You weren't listening to what I was really saying. You did evil before mine eyes and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, behold, my servants shall eat, but you stay hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall stay thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you're going to stay ashamed. Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but you're going to cry and weep. Brothers and sisters, we're here to eat and drink right now as servants of God. But the question is, during the week, during your own lives, in your family, in your ecclesia, are you living as True servants. That's the question that comes out of this, brothers and sisters. So, final verse in chapter 59. We'll just read these, these words and we'll leave them hanging as we come to concentrate on the one who these words refer to. Because in this section, brothers and sisters, God says... True service requires you to act like me. If you don't, don't think you can get away with it. My son's coming. My anointed son is coming and he's going to judge you. You didn't think I was about judgment anymore? It's all about salvation? No, no. He's coming and he's going to judge you. And in this section, there are four songs, four more songs, four prophecies of the coming conqueror who's going to destroy all the enemies of the true servants, whether they're Babylonians, whether they're Assyrians, or even whether they're the brothers and sisters of the true servants. It's powerful stuff, brothers and sisters. It really requires soul searching. So have a look. Let's just read verse 15 down to verse 18. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and Yahweh saw it. Here's this first song of the coming conqueror. It displeased Yahweh that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede on behalf of these true servants who were being punished by their brothers and sisters. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. There's our righteousness and salvation brought together again. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. This is not talking about a servant that's suffering, brothers and sisters. This is talking about a warrior who's coming back to be able to pay back all the enemies of the true servants. He's going to put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. He's going to be clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his enemies, his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. I'm going to remember him now, brothers and sisters. I'm going to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. He did come as the suffering servant. 
He was the first faithful, true servant. He's opened up the way to show us how to follow and become true servants ourselves. But he's coming back, brothers and sisters. He's coming back as the conqueror, as the victor, as the one who will reap vengeance on the enemies of God. The enemies of God are anyone who substitute God's salvation or who legalise God's salvation. That's what Isaiah is telling us. May it be, brothers and sisters, that we take the spirit of what Isaiah wants us to understand about true service and follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ as we remember him now, waiting for the day when he returns to claim those true servants as his own.